Welcome back to this lecture series for ethics. In this video we will continue to discuss the moral philosophy of Immanuel Kant. And in order to do that I want to recall to your mind a distinction we made previously which lays the groundwork for understanding the major themes in Kant's theory. So you'll recall that Kant takes a deontological approach to ethics. It's an approach to ethics which, unlike consequentialism or unlike utilitarianism, really focuses on following rules and performing one's duty. And as we've seen, it focuses on doing this absolutely. absolutely. This is the moral absolutist aspect of Kant's theory. So he tells us that there is a moral law, that this moral law dictates that there are certain actions we can never perform, Right? It's never okay to tell a lie, it's never okay to steal, it's never okay to um, cheat or defraud someone, it's never okay to murder. And the ultimate explanation for those things is that those actions are not universalizable. They're actions that maybe one individual could perform, but they're not actions that could serve as a moral law for everyone. They're not maxims that could be universalized. And not only does Kant think that we must abide by these moral absolutes, but he says the way we should act in toward the moral law is out of respect for that moral law. We must act from duty, by doing the right thing, by following the moral law, merely because we recognize it is the right thing to do. So those are the major aspects of the absolutist um, component of Kant's theory. But you remember I said there's another component as well which we're going to begin looking at in this video. And that other component is this idea that Kant had that persons deserve respect. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, in broad strokes, Kantian ethics is committed to this idea that there is something special about human beings, or specifically rational beings, which makes them unlike anything else in the universe. And we've seen hints of this already. The human being or any being with reason is a being with freedom. It's a being that's able to make choices. And it is a being that can understand and follow the moral law. Now because rational beings are unlike anything else in the universe and unlike anything else that exists, they have a special status. And because they have this special status, that implies that these beings, human beings, rational beings, beings with reason, it implies that they deserve to be respected. So we're going to begin looking at this aspect of Kant's ethics in this video, but I want to begin with just some general reflections on this notion of respect itself. Because it's a word we might commonly use, but it's also a concept that we don't often think about in much detail and think about what does it actually mean to respect another person. Now the first observation I would make is that respect is similar, it's, well it's a sort of attitude we have toward another person. Right? There's all sorts of attitudes you might have toward another person. You might hate them or love them, like them, dislike them, be annoyed by them, be jealous toward them, be interested in them, be intrigued by them. Right? These are all attitudes that we can have toward another person. And respect is just one of those attitudes. And I think to see what is really fundamental to respect, it's interesting to consider the following question, or really the following pair of questions. Is it possible to respect someone you hate? That's the first question. Second question is, is it possible to hate someone that you love? Or to love someone that you hate? And I want to begin with the first question. Can you respect someone that you hate? And initially you might think, well, maybe not. I mean, respect is a positive attitude that we have toward another person. Hate is certainly a negative attitude, so maybe those can't go together. But I'm not quite so sure that's the case. I can actually think of many situations in which you might show respect for someone that not only do you not like or have any affection toward, or not even just dislike, but you actually hate. Maybe you have a rival in an athletic competition who you lose to and it makes these feelings of hatred swell up in you. You don't want what's best for that person on a personal level as a matter of your own private personal feelings. Yet, if you search deeper within you, if you try to take a more objective view, you also find you're able to respect the performance they had on the field that day. 
You might say, yes, I lost and I understand that these feelings of hatred are welling up inside me, but I have to respect the fact that my opponent displayed skill, they displayed strategy, and ultimately they bested me in a fair competition on the field that day. You can, of course, imagine the same thing in a military context fighting a war. There you literally, of course, have enemies that are the very purpose of their actions is to kill the other side, to take the lives of the other side. And naturally, of course, this can um, cause feelings of hatred to well up and be somewhat commonplace. At the same time, though, you can imagine either side respecting the power, respecting the uh, strategy, and respecting the ability of their opponent in that warfare. Or also imagine another case. Let's say you um, committed some sort of very serious crime. Let's say you committed a murder and you're before the judge, and the judge gives you a very harsh sentence, maybe even life in prison. Inside of you, you you could again feel those feelings of hatred welling up inside of you, while at the same time saying, I respect that the judge did the right thing. I respect respect the fact that I deserve to be punished, and the judge simply carried out their duty in an unbiased and impartial manner. I'm not suggesting that's easy. In the the vast majority of cases, when you really are angry or you hate someone, it's very hard to take a more objective point of view and actually show respect for that person. It actually, most of the time, wouldn't happen. But conceptually, you you could see it happening. In fact, it does happen sometimes. It's not so hard to imagine how you could both hate and respect someone. So that's the first thing. Now, let's, let's compare this to the other question, can you love somebody that you hate? Now, many times students will tell me that, in fact, you can, and they'll appeal to this idea, the common idea of sort of a love-hate relationship, right? Maybe you're in a relationship with a significant other that you love, but they make you very angry, they do things um, that you think are wrong and hurtful, and so you have a situation where you love this person and you say you hate them at the same time. So maybe you might say, well, yeah, I mean, just like you can respect and hate someone, maybe you can love and hate someone as well. And some would say that. My intuition here is a little different, though. I don't think you can legitimately love someone that you also legitimately hate. I'm not denying that the people we love will hurt us and make us angry and make us sad and make us uh, even resentful at times. I'm not denying that that happens. But if you think fundamentally about what love and hatred are, Love would imply that you desire what is good for the other person. Hatred would imply that you desire what is bad for the other person. And so while the people that we love can anger us, and they can inspire feelings that we might think are hatred or echoes of hatred, I don't think you can really hate someone that you also love. Those two things seem to be incompatible with me. Love implies a real, true, and deep affection. Hatred implies just the opposite. Now, what is the purpose of this? Well, I think it's actually quite interesting that, in fact, you can respect someone you hate, but you can't, if I'm right, you can't love someone you hate. And what I think this shows is that respect, the reason you can respect someone you hate is because fundamentally respect is not about your personal feelings of affection for another individual. You can respect someone you don't know, you can respect someone you dislike, you can respect someone who annoys you, you can even respect someone who you hate. And that's because what respect is about isn't about your personal affection. What respect is about is a recognition of the status of another person. And this makes complete sense because think about situations where someone is disrespected. Whenever someone is disrespected, the idea is that they're not being treated in a way that their status demands. So, for instance, if you're in a classroom and the whole class is talking and not letting the teacher teach the class, the idea is that not only is this counterproductive, but it's disrespectful to the teacher because the teacher has a certain status of authority in the classroom, and that ought to be respected. In the military, of course, everyone has a rank and should be addressed in a certain way, and if they're not addressed in the proper way, you've shown disrespect by not respecting their status. So, if you think about our society and the sort of social statuses we have as a parent or a teacher, a member of the military, 
um, a position you might have at work, right? A, your position that maybe is a captain on an athletic team, right? There's all sorts of statuses we get through society, through our social relationships. But the sort of status that Kant is going to be concerned about isn't like that. What Kant is going to claim is that we have a duty to have a certain amount of respect for all human beings, all rational beings as such. The reason you respect another um, human being isn't because they've attained some position in a social hierarchy. The reason you respect another human being is because they have a unique status, merely in virtue of being able to reason and having freedom and being different from anything else in the universe. And so all human beings have a special status that must be respected, whether they are rich or poor, whether they're powerful or powerless, no matter what their position is in the social hierarchy. And to some extent, this is a common sort of idea. It underlies and undergirds our idea of human rights. The idea of human rights is that all human beings as such deserve to be treated in a certain way, deserve certain privileges, rights, and liberties. And the Kantian ethic is going to echo or reflect that idea. All human beings, all rational beings have a special status, and because they have that special status, we must show respect to them, and it's a foundational component of Kant's ethical view. So, in Kant's view, we have a moral duty to show respect for all human beings. But what does it mean to show respect for a human being? How do we show disrespect for a human being? What is the definition of that? Kant gives an explanation of this in what is known as his principle of humanity. And he explains this in a couple different ways. So, the first time he explains the principle, he says, Now I say, a human being, and generally every rational being, exists as an end in itself not merely as a means for the discretionary use for this or that will, but must in all its actions, whether directed toward itself or also to other rational beings, always be considered at the same time as an end. There's a number of components here, but um, the basic idea that Kant is trying to get across is that to respect another human being means you don't use them as a means to an end. And I think this comes out even more clearly in the other place he explains the principle of humanity, which is a little more uh, simplified, a little shorter, more succinct in the first statement. Kant tells us, so act that you use humanity in your own person as well as in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. Okay, so the general meaning is clear enough. We should never use another human being as a means to an end. But notice that Kant doesn't just say, um, don't use a human being as a means to an end. He says, don't use them merely as a means to an end. And that would seem to bring up some complications or further things to be explained. He also tells us that to respect another human being means to treat that being also as an end, an end in themselves. Well, what does that mean? To answer these questions, I want to take a more specific look at the principle of humanity and break it down into three components. So the way I see it, there's these three components to the principle, what I'll call the mere means prohibition, the humanity as end requirement, and the self-respect requirement. So let's start with the mere means prohibition. So this comes from the part of the statement where he says that When it comes to treating human beings, we should never treat another human being merely as a means. And I'm going to call this the mere means prohibition. So this brings up the former question, right? What does it mean to treat someone as a means to an end? What does it mean to treat them merely as a means to an end? Because I can think of all sorts of ways that I treat other people as a means to an end, but that don't strike me as really disrespectful or morally wrong in any way. So, for instance, I go to the dentist to get my tooth, uh, my teeth cleaned. You might say, well, I'm using, am I using the dentist as a means to an end? If you're in this class listening to this lecture, you might say, eh, are you using me as a means to the end of gaining the knowledge you need to get a good grade in this course? When I go to the store, am I using the cashier as a means to an end of buying my groceries? There's all sorts of transactions in our everyday lives where it seems like we use people as a resource or a tool to get to the ends we want to get to. 
So certainly Kant can't be saying that all those things are wrong. So this puts a spotlight on on the word, on the phrase, a mere means. What does it mean to use someone merely as a means to an end? And in order to understand this, I want to compare the following three cases, which I think can give a further explanation of this point. So case one. Rachel enslaves Ryan and forces him upon threat of death to perform hard physical labor. Now in this case, it is absolutely uncontroversial that Ryan, uh, that Rachel has used Ryan merely as a means to an end. She has literally enslaved Ryan and forced him against his will to perform this hard physical labor. And what is missing here? I mean, of course this is an extremely morally corrupt and evil thing to do. And the question is, why? Why is Rachel merely using Ryan as a means to an end? Well, the main thing that seems to be missing here is agreement or consent on the part of Ryan. Ryan is forced to do this against his free will. He's not granted his autonomy to choose whether he wants to perform this hard physical labor or not. It is simply forced upon him upon the threat of death. And I think this gives us some insight into what Kant means by a contrast between the concept of using someone as a means to an end or a mere means to an end. When you use someone as a means to an end, you might just be taking advantage of a service that they're voluntarily agreeing to provide to you. When you use someone merely as a means to an end, you're overriding or undermining their autonomy, forcing them against their will, or in, other, in, in some other sense, coercing them or manipulating them to get them to do what you want. And Kant's fundamental idea is that, well, you can't coerce or um, force or manipulate a person to get them to do what you want. Because that really just would be treating them like a tool, like an object to get the things you need, right? Rachel says, well, I need this hard physical labor performed. I don't want to do it myself. I'll just force Ryan to do it as if he was a machine or a robot or a tool that is just sitting there and waiting to do Rachel's bidding. But of course that's not true. Ryan is a person. Ryan has autonomy. Ryan has reason. Ryan has freedom. Ryan can understand the moral law. Because of those things, Ryan deserves a certain status, and Ryan deserves respect. And to treat Ryan as though he were just merely an object is a fundamental sign of disrespect to the status of a human being. And we can see this clearly in case two, where I'm imagining Ryan hires Rachel to teach philosophy at the local university. Here, Rachel uses Ryan as a means to an end, but not merely as a means. Well, why is this? Well, Rachel asks if Ryan wants to do this. She is compensating Ryan. Ryan agrees to perform the service uh, out of his own free will and autonomy. So although Rachel is getting something out of this relationship, namely she's getting someone to teach the course that needs to be taught, there's no sense in which Ryan is treated merely as a means to an end. So when we're comparing these things, certainly um, consent and autonomy are fundamental features of what it means to treat someone as a, uh, as a mere means or just as a means to an end. Now, the one other thing I would say here is that the, the situation is not always so cut and dry. In case one, it's clear that Ryan is being treated merely as a means. In case two, it's clear he's not. But what about case three? Ryan is in destitute poverty and desperate to do whatever he can to survive. Rachel's, uh, Rachel offers him work at a factory that involves long hours, 14-hour days, dangerous working conditions, and little pay. Ryan agrees to work at the factory. Rachel has exploited Ryan's unfortunate circumstances. Has she used Ryan as a mere means to an end? Now, I don't bring this case up in order to give you a clear answer to what the, um, how we should answer that question, but just to show you that there's cases where it's going to be more complicated. On the one hand, you might say, look, Ryan signed on the dotted line. No one forced Ryan to take this job, um, and so his autonomy was preserved. On the other hand, you might say, well, Ryan, practically speaking, was forced. He's in destitute poverty. He has no other real good options. This is the only way he can survive. And Rachel has exploited or taken advantage of the circumstances, essentially treating Ryan as a resource to be exploited instead of as a human being, a rational being, with rights and a status and dignity um, all on his own. 
So again, that's a more controversial case, and I won't give you an answer here, but just to show you that it's not always going to be so clear whether we're treating people as a means to an end or a mere means. And in any case, what this would mean for Kant is that we should be very cognizant in our relationships of others, whether we are giving them the status and respect they deserve, or whether we really are exploiting them and using them. Now, one final point I want to make about the mere means prohibition is I want to show you how he applies this to the false promising case that we discussed earlier. So you remember in the false promising case, we imagine a person who needs money. He says, I'm going to make a, to promise to, um, I'm going to get a loan, promise to pay the money back with no intention of ever actually paying it. So he's making a false promise. Now we saw there that Kant thinks doing so is wrong because lying is not universalizable. But here we can also see he applies the principle of humanity and says, this gives another explanation of why doing this is wrong. So Kant says, secondly, as far as necessary or owed, uh, oh, secondly, as far as necessary or owed duty to others is concerned, someone who has it in mind to make a lying promise to others will see at once that he wants to make use of another human being merely as a means who does not at the same time contain, contain in himself the end. For the one I want to use for my purposes by such a promise cannot possibly agree to my way of proceeding with him and thus himself contain the end of this action. So what is the point here? Remember, when we use someone as a mere means to an end, we treat them like an object or a tool. We undermine their autonomy. So suppose you lie to someone, suppose you make a false promise. You say, okay, if you give me this money, I'll definitely pay you back, but you're just lying. You never will. Now, when they act, when they agree to give you that money, they're acting on the basis of certain information. In this case, the information that you're giving them is that you have an intention to pay them back in the future. But if that's false information, if you're lying about that, then in a way you're sort of manipulating them or coercing them to do what they want. Right, to, to respect someone's autonomy, you have to give them the full information they need to make the decision, let them weigh the costs and benefits, and then let them make a free decision about what they want to do. But if you lie to them, then they're working on faulty information. They don't have the full picture. You're forcing them to live in the world that you want them to believe is true, even though it's actually a false world. You want them to believe you're going to pay the money back, but you have no intention of doing so. And so if they have faulty information, they can't make a free choice. If they can't make a free choice, you've undermined their autonomy. And you're just asking yourself the question, what can I say to this person to get them to do what I want? And of course, that's exactly how we treat objects. We say, what do I need to do to my car to get it to take me from A to B? What do I need to do to my computer to allow it to run the programs I want it to run? And that's fine to treat objects like that. It's fine to treat tools like that. It's fine to treat machines like that. But human beings are not objects, tools, or machines. We have autonomy, and we deserve respect. And so for that reason, Kant also believes that the principle of humanity shows why it's wrong to lie or wrong to make a false promise. So now let's turn to the second component of the principle of humanity. Kant tells us that in addition to never treating another human being merely as a means, we also have to treat human beings always at the same time as an end. And I'm going to call this the humanity as end requirement. So we are required to treat every human being, a rational being, as an end or an end in itself. Now this is sort of a difficult concept to wrap your mind around at first because well, what does that mean? An end means like a goal or an aim or an outcome well, so of our actions, right? The means is the process we use to get there. The end is the goal we're trying to seek. So what does Kant mean when he says that we should be using humanity as an, or treating humanity as an end? Treating humanity as an end in itself. So for further explanation of this point, it's helpful to see that Kant connects this idea of treating others as ends in themselves with the idea of irreplaceability. So he tells us, entities whose existence in itself is an end, an end such that no other end can be put in its place, for which they would do service merely as a means. So I think here it's helpful. Let's go back to Aristotle for a second. 
Aristotle said that there is a highest good, and that good is happiness. And it's the highest good because it is the good at which everything aims, and there's nothing else that's more important than it. And so in a certain way, you could say, look, there's nothing you would replace happiness with because everything is just a means to happiness. And what Kant is telling us here is that the way we should treat other human beings is with that sort of importance. Right? We should treat other people, other rational beings, other human beings in such a way that they cannot just be replaced. That they cannot just be swapped out for something else. They cannot just be traded or exchanged. And this idea is crystallized even further when he tells us that human beings, right, insofar as we should treat them as ends in themselves, must have a certain sort of value which he calls dignity. So he tells us in the following famous passage, everything has either a price or a dignity. What has a price can be replaced with something else as its equivalent. Whereas what is elevated above any price and hence allows of no equivalent has a dignity. So what is this difference? Well, when we say something has a price, we are saying it has a certain sort of exchange value. Right, so your car might have a certain value, let's say, of $10,000. And if you sold the car for $10,000, then assuming that's fair market value, we would have said, look, you got fair value in return. You didn't actually lose anything. But of course, we don't think that way about human beings. If tragically a person dies, then we don't say, well, we could just replace that person with someone else. Or, you know, we, if we just get enough monetary compensation for this loss, then we would be fully um, made whole in that transaction. That's not the way we should or do think about human beings. And what Khan is saying is that human beings have a dignity that makes it such that there's nothing you could trade for a human being that would ever make up their value. And one way to think about this is that um, in one place Kant says that human beings are above all price. Right? He says here, elevated above any price. Now what does that mean? Well, it means something like priceless. And what do we mean by the word priceless? We don't mean worthless. We actually mean of the highest worth. That there is no price, there's no amount of money that you could put on a human being or a being with reason. They have a certain status or dignity that, of course, as we're seeing, must be respected. And in fact, it is just for this reason that we see Kant referring to rational beings as persons where everything else, all non-rational beings, are merely considered things. So Kant tells us, non-rational beings still have only a relative worth as means and are therefore called things. So if, you're a, if we're talking about a being without reason, whether it be a car or a tree or a computer, or a dog, or a cat, or a cow, right? Any being like that, they have value, but always a relative value, always a value as a means to an end. A dog is valuable insofar as it provides protection or companionship. Maybe a cow is valuable because it provides milk. A computer is valuable because it allows you to engage in, in, in word processing or, or do the work you need for your job. So all n non-rational beings are just things they have this relative worth as means, as means. But when it comes to rational beings, he says, rational beings are called persons because their nature already marks them out as ends in themselves. This is exactly why we cannot treat other people as a mere means to an end. Because while other people can be useful to us and to society, we cannot treat them merely as useful objects. They are persons, not things, and as he says here, they must be treated as objects of respect. And because Kant thinks this, and because he draws the category of rational beings um, such as to exclude non-human animals, he takes a very different view of animals than we see, for instance, in the utilitarians. For the utilitarians, what matters when we think about whether we have to treat you with equal rights or respect is or... Uh, give you moral consideration is can you suffer? Can you feel pleasure and pain? And the idea for the utilitarians is that, well, look, yeah, animals can feel pleasure and pain, they can suffer, so it's wrong to mistreat them. But on Kant's view, animals fall under the category of non rational beings, and all non rational beings are just things. 
which means we are permitted to treat them much in the way that we treat any other object. And he makes this point in the following famous passage from his le lectures on ethics. He says, All animals exist only as a means, and not for their own sakes, and that they have no self-consciousness, whereas man is the end. So man, or rational beings, or human beings, must be treated as ends in themselves, as having a fun the fundamental importance that we place on what uh, we would consider to be the highest good. Their ends in themselves, and that they cannot be replaced. But he says animals, they have no self-consciousness, they don't have reason, they can't understand the moral law, and for that reason they exist merely as means to an end. Their value comes from their use. And so Kant continues on, he says, Look, if a man has his dog shot because it can no longer earn a living for him, he is by no means in breach of any duty to the dog, since the latter, the dog, is incapable of judgment. Now, does this mean it's necessarily okay to have the dog shot? No, maybe the dog would have been of use to someone else. Maybe if you're, and Kant suggests this in the rest of the passage, Maybe if you're violent to animals, it will be more likely that you'll be violent to human beings in the future by harming your character. But his point just is that if this man has his dog shot because it's not useful to, any, uh, uh, to him anymore, he has not committed any violation to the dog itself. Because the dog is not rational, the dog is a thing, so the dog doesn't have the status of dignity, it doesn't deserve respect, and it doesn't get to have rights. That sort of moral status, Kant reserves only for human beings, only for rational beings, and it is because rational beings have a dignity and are not valued merely from their price or their utility or usefulness. So this brings us to the third and final component of the principle of humanity. When we are treating the idea that we can never treat another person as a mere means, the idea that we must treat another person as an end in themselves, those ideas don't just apply to how we treat other people. Kant tells us they also apply to how we treat ourselves. He says, we have to do those things in your own person as well as in the person of any other. And I'm calling this the self-respect requirement. And of course, this makes sense. If the idea is we can never treat a person as a mere means, and we must always treat people as ends in themselves, well, we should keep in mind that we also are persons. And so those same strictures, those same rules that apply to how we treat others, also apply to how we treat ourselves in our own person. And to see how he applies this idea, I want to look at a few examples. So first, I want to go back to the self-preservation case we talked about previously, where we talked about an individual who foresees that their future life in front of them is going to be filled with suffering and is considering whether to put an end to their own life. Now, we saw previously already, that, or I hinted at for you, that Kant does believe that suicide is morally wrong. And in this passage, we get some further indication of why. Part of the reason is that he believes it violates the principle of humanity. So here's what Kant says. If to escape from a troublesome condition, he destroys himself, he makes use of a person merely as a means to preserving a bearable condition up to the end of life. So he says, look, if you end your life because you foresee the remainder of your life will be suffering and not... Um, there will be there'll be no enjoyment, um, you won't gain any good from it, then you are using your own person as a mere means to an end. You are saying, the end I'm trying to achieve is the reduction of my own suffering, and I'm going to take my life as a means to achieving that end. But of course, if you're doing that, then you're treating yourself as an object or tool to achieve some further end. And Kant continues on, he says, but this is not how we treat human beings, including yourself. A human being is not a thing, hence not something that can be used merely as a means, but must in all his actions always be considered as an end in itself. Thus the human, human being in my own person is not at my disposal, so as to maim, to corrupt, or to kill him. And right, so we see the idea here is that the end in mind should not be the reduction of your own suffering, 
Remember, your person in and of itself is the end. So the preservation of your person, the preservation of your existence as a rational being must take precedence over reducing pain, over experiencing pleasure, or any other purpose or end. Now, the idea that to end one's life, to take one's life into one's own hands, is to use oneself as a mere means to an end might be somewhat odd, because we might say, well, look, um, isn't consent being given here? Right, in this case, I don't have to get the consent of another person. I just have to get my own consent. If I agree that this is the course of action I want to take, then why isn't that enough to say I'm not treating myself as a mere means to an end? I think part of the reason comes, again, from the uh, end of this uh, passage I read, where he says, the human being in my own person is not at my disposal. Right, so what he's saying here is a claim about Who owns yourself? And what he's saying is that you are not a self-owner. You do not own yourself. And I think we we can get a better handle on why he thinks that by looking at another example he talks about, not in our reading, but in the lectures on ethics. In his lectures on ethics, Kant talked about prostitution. And he held that prostitution was morally wrong because it also violated the principle of humanity. So here's what he says, human beings have no right, therefore, to hand themselves over for profit, as things for another's use in satisfying the sexual impulse. For in that case, their humanity is in danger of being used by anyone as a thing, an instrument for the satisfaction of inclination. Right, so with prostitution, you might say, well, why can't I just agree of my own free will and autonomy to use my body in a way that's going to satisfy another's sexual impulse and gain me money? Well, the problem there for Kant is on the one hand, yes, you're using your body as an object, but you might say that about any sort of employment. The fact that we're talking about prostitution here isn't really, doesn't really matter. Any time you say, I'm going to be at a specific time, uh, at a specific place at a specific time, to do a specific task, no matter what that job is, in essence, you're using your body as a means to the end of attaining money, or whatever it is else you want to get out of that employment um, um, arrangement. So it's, that's not really the issue. The issue is that you are not in a position where you can just hand yourself over as a mere thing for another satisfaction. And that is because you do not own yourself. And we should think about two different conceptions of who owns your person. Some philosophers, traditionally uh, coming from a religious point of view, have said, well, the human person is owned by God. The human person is a creation of God, so because people get to own the things they create, God owns us. On the other hand, a more modern view, um, you can find this specifically in the political philosophy of John Locke, um, who says, we are self-owners. Every person owns themselves. And what Kant is saying is that both of these views are wrong. God does not own us. We do not own ourselves. And why is that? Because a person is not a thing to be owned. And if a person is not a thing to be owned, then you cannot simply use your person in any way you want. You can't use your person as an object. Um, You can't make yourself an object of another person's uh, sexual desire to gain money. You can't treat your life as an object to the end of reducing suffering by ending it prematurely. Both suicide and prostitution, Kant thinks, violate the principle of humanity precisely because neither of them shows the proper self-respect. Neither of them shows the proper recognition of the status that human beings have and their fundamental dignity. And the fact that, again, human beings, rational beings are persons and ultimately are not things. So I will stop there. Um, Thank you as always for listening, and I'll see you in the next video.